In 1939, just as the storm clouds of war were about to burst, Germany would make a huge blunder. It was one that would ultimately start the slow advance towards total defeat, even before war broke out. This is the story of the first spy balloon in modern history, and how an act of extreme intelligence led to one heck of a dumb conclusion. Let me set the scene. It's July 1939, in the dead of night. In the chain home receiver hut at Canudan, a young and tired operator leans over the cathode ray tube in front of him, watching monotonous blips on the screen. For hours, signals have been sent out from the tall masts, which stand like sentinels above the small facility, but in the ease of peacetime, they hardly ever yield a result. Suddenly, the operator is wide awake. Sir, sir, I've got something. Whatever it is, it... It's absolutely vast. As the night proceeds, other chain home stations along the English coast pick up the same anomaly as it's tracked northwards. As the information is filtered through to fighter command at Bentley Priory, it becomes clear what the X-ray is, a huge airship. Given the political deterioration on the continent, it can only be of German origin, and the most likely candidate is the Graf Zeppelin. But hasn't that been decommissioned? The reason for its presence is immediately clear. All at once, a feeling of foreboding falls across those gathered at fighter command. Will the German airship gather the vital intelligence needed to render Britain's air defence system useless? On board the huge airship, technicians pore over the data they have already collected. These readings make no sense, Herr General, one of them reports to his superior. Either our equipment is broken, or these Englanders aren't able to intercept our radio signals as we thought. The Germans have just made a catastrophic blunder and will draw conclusions which will lead to their defeat over the skies of Britain a year later. Britain also comes to incorrect conclusions that night, but these will spur them on to improve their air defence system and give them a fighting chance in the bloody battle ahead. By the start of the Second World War, radar as we know it today was not a secret. Both Britain and Germany had the technology, although neither side was absolutely sure the other was using it as war was declared. In fact, the theory behind radar had been published way back in the 19th century. Then, in 1904, the German engineer, Christian Horsmeyer, had devised a naval navigation device, essentially radar, but found very little interest among military circles. By the mid-1930s, this had changed, and both Germany and Great Britain were hastily adapting similar technology for military use. As often happens when different groups try to develop an idea independent from each other, the two nations would develop very different types of radar technology. Of the two approaches, Germany's could be said to be more sophisticated, and this fact is ultimately what made its engineers draw disastrous conclusions about Britain's RDF network. While the Wehrmacht put emphasis, for the most part, on the need for mobile radar units to be used offensively, Britain was more concerned with defensive measures. And so, within a matter of a few years, the British coastline became dotted with huge, steel lattice-like mast structures, which became known as Chain Home. Germany was quick to notice this change in British coastal architecture, and was determined to discover what was behind the huge building project. A detailed intelligence gathering campaign was launched against Britain by the Third Reich. This even included German tourists who were encouraged to visit locations such as Bordsey, then the main research location for RDF. On their return, they could pass on vital intel, most likely without realising what they were doing. But a more technical analysis was needed, and so soon to be Reich Marshal Göring, along with General Oberst Mürsch and other high ranking Luftwaffe officers, were convinced by General Wolfgang Martini to secretly adapt the Graf Zeppelin for a new role. Martini was head of Luftwaffe signals, one of several independent German intelligence departments, and wanted to determine exactly what the mysterious English structures were. To do that, he would need a platform larger than any conventional aeroplane then in service. He needed an airship. Such an aircraft was ideal as it provided ample room for the large equipment needed to analyse radio waves. It also had huge endurance, which would be needed for an extended intelligence flight. Finally, an airship could also remain stationary over a target, which no similar sized aircraft at the time was capable of doing. 
Rather than spending money on constructing brand new airships, which would use valuable resources needed for aircraft production, Martini was given permission to use ones already in existence. But which ones exactly? It has been stated by Wood and Dempster that Martini used both LZ-127, the Graf Zeppelin, and LZ-130, the Graf Zeppelin II. The former airship, which had made some of the most outstanding navigational feats in the air, had been retired in 1937. The latter was made operational only in September 1938 and bore the name Graf Zeppelin on its keel, but with no following numerals. After several of its own remarkable flights, LZ-130 had also been fitted with monitoring devices to study electric discharge following the Hindenburg disaster. After further digging, it seems likely that only LZ-130 was used, and this older study merely confused the two identically named airships. Thus, LZ-130 was converted for its new role, with high-frequency receivers being installed, and an aerial array rigged underneath the gondola. And so, with the airship fitted out, General Martini joined his technicians on this secret flight to Britain. Slipping her mooring ropes at Frankfurt on the 12th of July 1939, the crew of the Graf Zeppelin used the darkness to hide their passage across the North Sea and towards the British coast. Their target was Bordsea, the RDF research station in Suffolk. It was where things would start to go terribly wrong for the Germans. In fact, this was the first flight of many planned data-gathering missions. The chief concern of Martini and his technicians aboard LZ-130 that day was to ensure the elaborate equipment aboard actually functioned. Arriving over the English coast near Bordsea, the airship then turned north and flew parallel to the coastline. Aboard, the sensitive equipment picked up nothing but loud crackling. Not what they would have expected from functioning transmitters in a radar system emitting very high and ultra-high frequency radio waves. In fact, the Germans had fallen into a trap of confirmation bias by interpreting their results only through the prism of their own understanding of radar technology. They would come to catastrophic conclusions. These findings would be compounded by a later and more fruitless intelligence flight in August. As the Graf Zeppelin continued its maiden flight in its new role and the first ever military electronic reconnaissance in history, a huge opportunity was missed. An opportunity for mockery. The airship was tracked as it moved up the coast, eventually reaching the north of England, surrounded by heavy cloud. At this point, LZ-130 reported back its position to Germany, stating it was at a point off the Yorkshire coast. In fact, British RDF fixed its position over Hull, which is actually inland on the Humber. When this glaring mistake was passed by British radio intelligence onto the fighter command control room at Bentley Priory, there were smirks all round. So Walter Pretty, then a flight lieutenant on radar duty, recalled that we were sorely tempted to radio a correction message to the airship, but this would have revealed we were actually seeing her position on radar, so we kept silent. And so the crew of LZ-130 returned to Germany, oblivious to the egg on their face, where alterations were made to its equipment. Its failure to collect usable data was blamed on installation faults and interference from the airship's own envelope. But this was not the final flight of the Nazi spy balloon, and this first inconclusive mission would have long-term ramifications for the German war effort. With further tests over Germany, and here I should note they were testing with very high and ultra-high frequency transmitters, as well as other improvements to technical apparatus on board, LZ-130 returned to Britain. On the 2nd of August 1939, at midnight, she again left Frankfurt and headed out in appalling weather that was chosen to hide her secret mission. War was imminent, and the strange structures dotting the English coast remained largely unexplained. This time General Martini had remained behind and command of the mission had been given to Obest Leutnant Goldswish. He had been ordered to remain 50 miles off the coast and to discover the frequency and location of any very high and ultra high frequency radio emitters in Britain. Reaching the coast, again near Bordsea, the airship was not picked up by radar at all and only visually sighted from the ground at 3pm the next day off the Kincardenshire coast in Scotland. This created quite a stir. While some sources have put this lack of radar interception down as a strange mystery, James Holland explains in his book that it was nothing of the sort. 
Rather than finding a weak link in chain home defence, LZ-130 had merely arrived just at the moment essential maintenance was being carried out to fix a fault in the system. It would actually turn out to be serendipitous and further confuse the Germans, forcing them to reach entirely the wrong conclusions about British radar capabilities. As a result of this second flight, the British now had visual confirmation that the Germans were up to no good. Following LZ-130's initial discovery, it was then shadowed at a safe distance by two RAF aircraft. A Mars Magister and an Avro Anson, which were based at Dice near Aberdeen, were sent up to identify the X-ray. As the airship didn't breach the three-mile limit, the RAF had no cause to intercept it with fighters. However, a photograph taken from the air clearly captures the name of the airship written across it in huge gothic front, Graf Zeppelin. The last sighting of LZ-130 was over the lighthouse at Girdleness, where the lighthouse keeper was not a little concerned to see the huge airship just a thousand feet above the sea. Following this, the Germans proceeded north and ended up over Scarpa Flow before they returned home. Again, no data was gathered, which seemed to confirm that Britain was using very or ultra-high frequency to detect aircraft off its coast at least not with the huge steel masts they had constructed. In fact, as the Germans understood, the chain home stations were transmitting high-frequency radio waves, which they supposed were useless for detecting aircraft. This analysis would significantly impact later operations launched against British shores by the Luftwaffe. In addition to gathering inconclusive evidence of operational radar installations in Britain, the missions had hardly remained secret. Sightings of German airships over Britain were reported in the Daily Telegraph, as well as other local papers. And as peace still reigned, Germany was asked to account for the Graf Zeppelin's presence over Scotland. Berlin's denial was accompanied with a rather feeble note. The airship cannot leave Germany without special permission. There can be no question of an intention to fly over or near British territory. There have, however, been severe storms the last day or two, and it is possible that the airship could have been blown off her course over the North Sea. So what did the Germans really think was going on around Britain's shores on the eve of war in 1939? And did anyone in the Third Reich actually know just how sophisticated the Dowding system had become? Well, it really depends on who you choose to believe. The celebrated German ace, Adolf Galland, had been quoted as saying that right up until the start of the Battle of Britain, the OKL strongly believed Chain Home was merely a detection network for shipping. James Holland explains that German confirmation bias in the run-up to war and a chance discovery later in 1940 may confirm the idea that Luftwaffe High Command had discounted operational radar in Britain. As mentioned previously, the Germans had themselves developed radar technology in the form of Freya and the mobile early Würzburg radar units using very high and ultra-high frequencies. The Germans didn't connect the high mast around chain home sites, which clearly dealt with high-frequency radio waves with an operational radar system. However, due to the combined work of Robert Watson Watt, Edward Appleton and Arnold Frederick Wilkins and their teams, high-frequency radio detection had been made possible. Nevertheless, it's not how German technology worked, and so, in their eyes, those mysterious masts must have been used for some other unknown function. However, it has to be said that German engineers did realise it was a detection device, but didn't give it credit enough as one that could accurately track aircraft. This was the natural conclusion, so Holland says, after the Germans discovered abandoned British mobile radar units on the continent following the fall of France. As these were clearly aerial detection devices and happily inferior technology to what the Germans had, the obvious conclusion was reached that this was all the RAF had to rely on. The masts on the coast must have been for some other purpose. However, Stephen Bungie refutes this and claims that there were members of the Luftwaffe that knew exactly what the masks were and how they were being used. Despite its initial failure to gather information with the Zeppelin reconnaissance flights, Bungie says that the 3rd Abteilung definitely knew about British radar by 1940. The 3rd Abteilung was the intelligence department run by General Martini. The 1939 flights might have been a failure, but the investigation clearly hadn't ended with the outbreak of war. 
By the time Britain was facing the Luftwaffe across the Dover Straits, Martini knew that aircraft were being directed by ground controllers and even knew most of the call signs used by the squadrons. However, due to the nature of interdepartment rivalry within the German intelligence branches, Bungie claims he kept the information to himself. In the Third Reich, knowledge was power. And apparently, with great Wissen comes immense Dummheit. Another person in the know was Hans Jeschenik, Luftwaffe Chief of Staff. In a report intended just for his staff and dated the 1st of May 1940, Jeschenik not only confirmed the existence of an electrical reporting device, but went into some detail about what was and wasn't known about it. While he was unsure if British radar was sophisticated enough at that point to distinguish enemy aircraft from friendly, he did know its major weakness, detecting low-flying aircraft at an appreciable distance. It is clear that this information was not widely circulated, according to Bungie, as the Luftwaffe was probing this capability in British radar way into 1941, rather than exploiting it. So what effect, if any, did the reconnaissance flight of the Graf Zeppelin have on the course of the Second World War, and in particular, the Battle of Britain? It's generally an accepted fact that without the doubting system, Britain would not have been able to resist the German air armada of 1940. The key link in that system was undoubtedly chain home, for its ability to give advance notice of incoming enemy raids. Had the chain home stations, even just on the south coast, been permanently put out of action, the Royal Observer Corps would not have been sufficient in alerting Bentley Priory of incoming aircraft. Yet, unbelievably, there was not a consistent effort on the part of the Germans to destroy British radar sites. Indeed, Edward Fennessy, one of the engineers who installed the filter room at Bentley Priory, explained that he and his colleagues had prepared for a very different series of events. Realising that the Graf Zeppelin was attempting to detect radio signals, the entire research facility at Bordsey had been evacuated when war was declared. There was fear of an imminent attack on the facility and other chain home sites. This threat never materialised. When Fennessy met General Martini at the Farnborough Air Show years after the war, he questioned him on this. According to him, the general explained that the sites were clearly non-operational, and then was severely shocked when Fennessy informed him that even his maiden flight in the Graf Zeppelin had been tracked by fully operational British radar. So again, we have a situation where historians are saying one thing, and the men who were there say another thing. I just wonder how good an actor Martini was, or if he really didn't know the full extent of British radar in 1939-40. Another fear that Fennessy and his colleagues had was that the Germans would discover the frequencies RDF operated on and then jam them. So afraid were they of losing their eyes beyond the horizon that huge efforts were put into developing countermeasures. When the Germans did begin to jam British radar, most significantly during the Channel Dash by the Scharnhorst in Gneisenau in February 1942, they were almost prepared. The countermeasures used by the Germans were later rendered ineffective simply by using similar frequency ranges that they used for radar defence over the Reich. It was gambled that the Germans weren't foolhardy enough to jam themselves. Another amazing blunder, given the fact that Jasenek reportedly knew about the limited range of chain home low stations, was the infrequency of low-level raids in 1940. Had the Luftwaffe launched an extended campaign of low-level attacks on RF airfields, they may have been able to suppress the British long enough to force a diplomatic conclusion to the war. Undoubtedly, it was not the RF who would have saved Britain from invasion, but rather the Royal Navy. Oberst Bettel Schmid of the 5th Abteilung, attached to the OKL General Staff, had made this clear in one early report, the same labelling Great Britain as the most dangerous enemy pre-1940. However, he also produced later reports which suggested that pursuing an air campaign against Britain was not a futile endeavour, contradicting that former report. Whatever Schmid and the Germans knew or didn't know, a rapid loss of RF personnel in the opening months of the Battle of Britain may even have been enough to douse Churchillian rhetoric and perhaps force a vote of no confidence, a renewed fervour for peace talks among some members of the British government. Had the Luftwaffe been able to win supremacy of the air and become a greater threat to the fleet, might Britain have sued for a favourable peace to save its empire? We will never know for sure. 
As you've made it this far, please like the video to help it spread to more people and feel free to let me know your thoughts in the comments section. Why not hang around and watch another video I made for you about another amazing Zeppelin mission that is almost beyond belief. It's a good one.